For those of you that are using the song books, if you were looking, the next song is not three, it's 44. So I know there are a few of you out there that still mark the books, um, whether because you just like it or you may have trouble seeing the screen, uh, whichever your case may be, 44 is the song after the lesson uh, if you're marking books. Uh, go ahead and get your Bibles and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to be looking uh, at the text here today. Uh, Patrick, as he usually does when he leads songs, sent me a message earlier and said, you know, is there a theme for uh, the songs today? You know, perhaps lawsuits, right? Like there's a lot of songs in the book, I'm sure, about not suing your brothers. Uh, I don't think there is. I couldn't find any, actually, uh, about that topic at all. Uh, and when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you may be going, okay, yeah, that's the chapter. And there's something about not suing your brothers. And there's something about uh, sexual morality and that seems pretty cut and dry. Let's move along, right? There's really not a lot there for us uh, to look at. But I want to suggest to you today uh, that Paul has something bigger in mind besides that. He's trying to solve a problem that they have amongst the brethren there. Uh, but the reason that he's trying to solve that problem is not just because of the problems that they specifically have with lawsuits and the example that he gives about sexual immorality. That we'll see how that ties together in just a minute. Uh, but what he's really trying to get them to understand is something that's timeless, something that we need to understand as well, and that really 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and even as he continues into the next chapters, are really about the idea of glorifying God. And so I appreciate the songs Patrick led for us on that topic today, uh, of glorifying God and the things that we do in the lives that we lead. Uh, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians, those of you who are visiting with us, and we've noticed that Paul has established some basic ideas, uh, specifically that while that church had many good things going for it, God has set things up in such a way that no one can boast before him, not just because he's God, but because everything that we have, the knowledge we have about him, uh, any of the blessings that we receive are all things that we only have because God has given them to us. And so if God has given them, let's not act as though we're somehow really great and awesome on our own merit. It's really just what God has blessed us with. Paul then continues on and tries to make the point that we then need to be imitators of him and how he led his life, that is Paul, as he was imitating Jesus, uh, and suffer the things that he suffered and not become conceited or uh, put to this high place. And then he begins talking about specific things that are going on in Corinth. And last time that began with putting away immorality, that we need to remove immorality from ourselves collectively as a group. Uh, and from our own lives, that those things need to be uh, separated or done away. As he moves now into chapter 6, he starts off with this idea here, a specific problem they're having, in verses 1 through 6, where he says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more then things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one there that should be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goes to, against law, goes to law with his brother and that before the unbelievers. Paul speaks up about a specific problem that they're having there in Corinth, and that's this problem of contention that we've already seen him discuss, right? He opened up the letter with this idea that, uh, I hear that there are divisions or factions among you, and it appears that these divisions and factions aren't just the kind of things uh, that might cause disagreements between brothers within the church, right? Where I disagree with you about this point or about that point uh, of doctrine, but it's gone beyond that. It's escalated to the point where internal problems that they're having have now become things where we have such a bad relationship that I'm going to sue you. I'm going to take it up with the civil secular courts outside in the world. This is a problem that Paul is saying, this is bad news. In fact, he says, I speak this to your shame. Paul says, this is a shameful thing that you're doing. It brings dishonor. It brings disgrace on the name of Jesus Christ that you wear. He goes and tells them, this is mind-blowing, really. He says, you're being immature. You're acting like children. Isn't there one wise, smart person in the whole group that can figure this out? 
If you've got a problem with your brother and you can't settle it, he says there ought to be people in your group who can sit down, mediate between you, and decide how we ought to handle things. Now, that's a good, important thing for us to just understand, right? I mean, I could conceive of a time where maybe I have a problem with one of my brothers, and we need to figure out how to solve that. That's an important bit of information that Paul tells us. Hey, don't go take the civil courts, right? Don't go airing your dirty laundry, as we might say, out there before the unbelievers. That's not how you handle things. That's a good bit of information for me to have. But you know what? I've never actually had to apply that in my life. There has not yet been a time in my life where I said, man, I've got a disagreement about money or defrauding or being defrauded by a brother, and man, I just can't figure this out. How are we going to settle this issue? That hasn't happened in my life. My guess is it hasn't happened very often in most of our collective lives here, right? If we took all of the collective years that we have together, how many times have we had to apply that in that specific instance? It's probably very rare. And so we could say, that's good information, Paul, but we don't really care about that. Let's move on to the next chapter where there's more interesting stuff to talk about. We like to talk about chapter 7. But I think what Paul has in mind for us and an application we need to make is what he's really trying to get at there, which is this. When you do things, when you act in a specific way, you either bring glory to God or you bring shame on him. Now that's something I can take and think about and go, how can I actually apply this particular topic? Paul, what is it that you're saying here that I need to figure out? And so Paul is going to tell us how it is that our actions can be used to glorify God. And so with that in mind, let's look and continue on with what he says there in verses 7 and 8. He says, now therefore... There is utterly a fault among you, or you have already failed in this because you go to law with one another. Why don't you rather suffer the wrong? Why do you not rather allow yourselves to be defrauded? No, you do wrong and you defraud, and that against your own brethren, or even against your own brethren. If there's something that I need to pull out of chapter 6 as an American, as someone in the 21st century, the thing that I need to get out of chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians is suffer the wrong. I need to get myself in a place where I can do what is so counterculture today. It is the most counterculture thing that we can probably do out there in the world. Look, we can live our lives in a pure way. We can do certain things a certain way and say, I'm going to keep myself pure and unspotted from the world. And people might look at that and go, oh, that's nice, that's interesting, that's quaint. But when you allow yourself to suffer the wrong, when you're unjustly accused, when someone treats you poorly, when you don't then stand up and say, I've got my rights, that's the most counterculture thing you can do in our society today. Because in America, especially today, the greatest slight that can be done against you is to get wrong put on you and have to just take it, isn't it? I mean, everything we always do anymore, any slight offense that ever gets laid against anyone gets turned into a big deal. I can't take that. I have rights. I'm going to sue you over that. I'm, whatever the case may be. No one seems to be able in our country anymore to just, as we used to say, turn the other cheek and just say, you know what? Let's move on. Why is that such a big, important idea that we need to wrap our head around? Well, I suggest to you the reason that we need to wrap our head around that idea is because of something similar that Peter will say over in 1 Peter chapter 2. Stick your finger here uh, or your mark and turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2 for just a minute. Peter over there tells us about suffering unjustly, about being wronged or beaten or abused in some way, as he's talking specifically to servants. But he lays out an important idea that Paul doesn't really touch on here, but it's the background, it's the motivation behind what he's saying, I believe. And so we're going to look at verses 19 through 24. 
where Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says, For this is an acceptable or a thankworthy or a commendable, depending on your translation, thing, if a man for conscience towards God endures grief and suffers wrongfully. For what glory is it if when you are buffeted or beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do well and suffer for it and take it patiently, this is commendable or well-pleasing to God. For even hereunto were you called, or to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Who did not sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile back again. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him that judges righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. Peter makes the connection between suffering unjustly and taking between being beaten and buffeted for nothing we've done wrong and Jesus. So when Paul says, why don't you rather just suffer the wrong? We could take that out and replace it with a synonym of, why don't you just act like Jesus did? What's the worst wrongful accusation you've ever suffered in your life? Right? Right? What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you where you were unjustly accused of something? My guess is it's not as bad as treason, right? Has any of you wrongfully been accused of treason against your government? My guess is no. What's the worst consequence you've ever had to bear for being unjustly accused, right? You were unjustly accused of something and you had to take whatever punishment came down because of that unjust accusation. I know that it wasn't crucifixion, because you're all still sitting here, right? None of us has ever been beaten and killed because of something that we unjustly suffered. And yet when we get slighted in some way, when someone accuses us something of bad motives or someone says something we did that we didn't do, we instead get up in arms when Jesus did what? Well, Peter says he didn't open his mouth. He didn't revile back. He didn't threaten He said he did what instead? He committed his cause, or he committed himself to God. What Paul is telling these people here in Corinth is, you are suffering things unjustly from someone, or you are getting something unjustly from someone, and instead of saying, God will judge, this is not that big of a thing, I will take the wrong because it gives me an opportunity in my life to exemplify Jesus. He says, instead, you go out, and instead of glorifying God in that manner, you instead shame him by saying, hey, we can't figure this out, Gentiles, heathens, Rome, solve our problem for us. I'm going to sue this guy who I call my brother. He says, it's a shame to you. It would be better to be defrauded. It would be better to suffer the wrong. But instead, he says, not only do you not do that, but you turn around and do it to other people. You defraud you wrong, you cheat them instead. Now, that's a big idea for us, I think, to get our heads around, to apply in our lives. But we may be asking ourselves, what's the big deal about it? What's the big problem here, Paul? Why is it such a big thing? What does it matter if I go out and sue my brother for something to to get corrected? Aren't I just trying to get justice? Aren't I just trying to make sure that righteousness is done? That the law is upheld? Isn't that a good thing? What's the importance of this idea? Well, Paul says to us in verses 9 and 10 that this has important applications. He says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators or idolaters or adulterers or effeminate or abusers of themselves with mankind or thieves or covetous or drunkards or revilers or extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says this stuff has eternal weight. It's got importance. Righteousness and being righteous and suffering wrong from the hands of other people and handling that in a righteous way has eternal weight implications. 
it's just not really that big a deal. What goes on down here when I'm unjustly accused, is it? I mean, if someone says, oh, you did this, or I'm going to cheat you out of this money, right? Let's say I'm in a business transaction with someone, and someone cheats me out of some money that I'm due. What's the real value of that? I mean, realistically, what's the real value of that? I mean, it might even be tens of thousands of dollars, let's say. That's a lot of money for most of us, right? I mean, I just have that kind of money to throw around and get rid of. And if I had that money coming in, that would be a big deal to me, right? But what's its eternal weight or value? When compared against eternal life, when compared against the kingdom of God, does it really matter that much? Is it really that big of a deal? If my going out and fighting with you, if we're in some transaction that we can't settle out, and we go outside there and we try and solve it out in the world and the court systems, and it causes someone out there to look at that and say, those Christians are ridiculous. I want nothing to do with it. They say they're brothers, they say they love each other, but look at the stupid things they quibble about. If it costs someone out there their soul because of how we act, was it worth it to get the money that I thought I was owed? Shouldn't I rather just suffer the wrong? Shouldn't I rather just be defrauded? Because what was the result of Jesus being defrauded? What was the result of Jesus suffering the wrong? This is the healing of you and me, wasn't it? So Peter says, it's by that act. It's by him suffering in that way. It's by his stripes that we all were healed. It's got eternal implications. Now Paul wants to make an important point here in verse 11, and it's this. He says, and such were some of you, but you are washed you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Paul turns right around and he says, that action, those lists of things and that behavior that you're exemplifying, that's who you used to be. You've missed an important point here, people. That's the way you used to handle things, right? Going out and saying, I have my rights, let's let the court settle this, and not just suffering the wrong. He says, that's how you used to do things, Corinth. We don't do things like that anymore. That's not the way that we play this game. He says, you were those people. You used to act in that way. That's the way we used to be, but we're not like that anymore because we're in Christ Jesus. Uh, Joshua had the reading for us a few minutes ago of Romans chapter 6. And I want you just to flip there for a minute. We're not going to take the time to read the whole thing again. But over in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14, what was Paul telling those people in Rome? What Paul was telling those people in Rome is, don't you know, don't you get it, don't you understand that while you used to live a life of sin, you're dead to that life now. We don't behave that way anymore. We've died to sin. We can't live in it any longer. That's not the life that we live. Instead, what he says down in verse 12 is sin shouldn't reign in our mortal bodies anymore. We have to crucify that old man. We have to put him to death. We died to that. And instead, he says in verse 13, don't be unrighteousness unto sin, but instead do what? Yield yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Sin doesn't have dominion over you anymore. You can make the choice for better and you must because that's not who we are. We died to that lifestyle. Now Paul is going to turn right around here and do something very strange in verse 12. He's going to start talking about sexual immorality again. And you're going, wait a minute, what does this have to do with lawsuits? What's he going on with here? But let's stick with him for a minute and look at verses uh, 12 through 17 together and see what it says. It says, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. All things are lawful, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Food for the belly and the belly for food, but God is going to destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God is raised both up by the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. Do you not know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members with a harlot? God forbid. 
What, do you not know that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, he says, will be made one flesh. But he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. Paul has an interesting thing that he wants to talk about. He says, I want to give you an example or an idea of how everything that we do has implications. The answer that I might give as an American today is say, but it's my right to go to the courts. The law says so. I'm not doing anything wrong, right? There's nothing sinful about me suing my brother. In fact, that's what the law prescribes that I should do if I've been defrauded. I mean, it's better than me beating the money out of them, right? It's a good step. It's my right. What Paul says is, look, there are all kinds of things that are lawful or legal for me, but what's the problem with many of them? Just because they're lawful doesn't mean they're profitable. Doesn't mean that it's the best course of action. Doesn't mean that we have to do that thing. And he gives an example of foods, right? He says, look, foods in the belly, they're made to go together. Uh, but they're all going to be destroyed anyway. He says the body is put together and it's meant for service to the Lord. Uh, But the law says, in Corinth, the law says you can go and join it to a harlot, right? Is that a good thing to do? It's legal, Corinth. All things are legal for me. Why don't we go do that instead? Why don't we have it that way? He says because even though those things are legal, they're not profitable for us. They're not good for us. And in fact, when we act in certain ways, he says, it makes us joined with that sin when we ought to be joined with who? We ought to be joined with Christ. He says we are one with the Lord. We're joined with him in body. Now that's an important idea because how did Jesus handle this? If I'm one with Jesus, I should be asking myself, how did Jesus handle this? And the answer I come to is very easy because we saw it over in Peter, right? He told us how Jesus handled this. He says, Jesus did things that were commendable before God. Jesus did things to the glory of the Father. And what Paul wants the Corinthians to understand, and what Paul needs us to grasp, is this idea that everything that I do has implications. Everything that I do will do one of two things. It will either bring glory to God, or it will be bringing shame on him because I'm one with him. And so what Paul tells us to do as we jump down into verses 18 to 20 is this. He says in his example he just gave, So flee fornication. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. What? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Paul tells us this important thing. He says that when we act in certain ways, we are the temple of God. And when we behave in a way that's inappropriate, what does that do to the temple? Defiles it. I don't know how up to speed you are on your Old Testament history, but how did God typically view people who defiled the temple? Right? I I mean, did he usually treat that fairly lightly and go, "Ah, that's no big deal, right? I mean, even before the temple, most of us know the story of Nadab and Abihu, right? Who, Who did what? They just brought the wrong fire to the altar. And God said, you know, it's no big thing. Right? Fire's fire. It doesn't really matter. Hey, you tried your best. Is that what he said? No. All the kids know the story because it's fantastic. I remember as a kid thinking, that's amazing. Right? He did what? Sent out fire and <laughs> consumed them. That's what he did with that. Wow. That's, that's not good, right? That's a bad situation there. How did God feel about defiling the temple? God says, You're the temple. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have from God. He dwells in you. And so what does that mean? Well, what that means there, he says, is you are not your own, right? You are not your own. You don't get to do whatever you want, however you want, with whatever you want to do. You are not your own. Why am I not my own, Paul? Why am I not my own? Well, verse 20, he tells me, he says, you have been bought with a price. 
Now, again, this is something that's hard for us to wrap our heads around because what Paul is basically telling us is something that's very abhorrent to us as Americans, right? Because we have two things that we value in this country. You know what they are? My rights and my freedom, right? That's, that's the American way, my rights and my freedom. And what Paul has just said is your rights, throw them out. And he says, in your freedom, it's imaginary. You're not your own. You're the slave of God. God bought you. He purchased you. You know what he purchased you with? That suffering that Jesus went through that wasn't just. He says, you're not your own. God bought you. You know what your job is as the possession of somebody else? He tells us. Your job, what God bought you for, what he purchased you for, was not for menial labor, was not to go out and tend the field, was not to come and bring him his food. What God bought you for was what? For his glory. God purchased you so you could do what for him? Glorify him in your body and in your spirit. And I think if we connect this back, what Paul would say there is, you know, the sexual immorality example that I just gave you, when we don't do that, what are we doing with our body? We're glorifying God. When I don't take my brother to court and I don't take all of these things out before the Gentiles and blaspheme the name of God before them, what am I doing? How am I glorifying God? I'm glorifying God in my spirit of compassion with you. So what Paul wants us to understand in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and the lesson that we need to apply is not don't just sue the brethren because that's easy, right? I can say, I've never done that. Sweet. I'm good. I can check off 1 Corinthians 6. I don't have to worry about that chapter. I've never sued the brethren. God is happy with me. But what I would challenge you to do is figure out how are we glorifying God in the things that we do and the way that we act. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you and we thank you for uh, this time we've had to open your word and to see the message that uh, Paul gave to the Corinthians. And we pray that you would help us to apply this in our lives in a way that's more challenging than just taking the easy way out and saying, I've never sued the brethren, so I'm okay. But God, we pray that you would help us to see uh, that the lives that we used to live, that the way we did things, whether it was how we treated our brothers or in the ways that we used our bodies or in the greediness that we used to exhibit, we pray that you would help us to put those things away and instead realize that that's who we used to be and we're not those people anymore. But because your son has died for us and we've died with him, that we ask that we would help, you would help us to walk in that new life, that life which he lived for you. We pray that you would help us to live that same life that you would help us to uh, glorify you in our actions so that when people see us suffering uh, wrongly and commending ourselves to you instead of taking it up in ways that we think would be justified, we pray that you would help us to do that so they can look at us and they can see your son exemplified in our lives. Father, we pray that you would help us to be mindful of the things that we do each and every day. Uh, Help us to remember that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we are your possession, Father. We pray that you would help us to live out our purpose, uh, our, our purpose in life for what you've purchased us for, and that's to glorify you in our bodies and in our spirits. Father, we pray that you would help us to do this. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen.